City officials are describing the case as a double murder. A judge and his wife gunned down in their home. That was a big mystery. Who did they come to kill? And then, why? Motives usually come right down to the same old thing, greed. An outrageous scam. There were millions of dollars. And a mayor with a dirty secret. Any suggestion that I was involved in planning the murder of Vincent Morgan Sherry is an outright lie. Bloodshed and betrayal on the bayou. Tonight, on Power, Privilege, and Justice. In September of 1987, police in Biloxi, Mississippi are called out to the home of one of the city's most prominent political couples, Vincent and Margaret Sherry. He's a state court judge. She's a city councilwoman. Or at least they were. I heard it on police radio about a suspicious death on Hickory Hill Circle. Told me to get to the scene as quick as I possibly could. I went in the house, went in the front door. It was sort of out of the ordinary. There's nothing disturbed. And then you got the room where Vince was, and he's laying on his back by the fireplace. The judge had been shot three times in the face. Burris then goes down the hallway to the master bedroom. Margaret. Sherry was on the floor with her shoulders against the bed and her feet up under the dresser. He finds spent 22 caliber shells near both victims. He also had small bits of foam recovered that indicated it was likely a silencer equipped weapon. We also recovered several unidentified fingerprints which were submitted for comparisons. Margaret's purse was in the den. It was open, had cash in it, had credit cards in it. I think Vince's wallet was on a dresser in the bedroom, credit cards and stuff in there. The house had not been ransacked. No valuables appeared to be missing. It was not a routine burglary or robbery. Close friend Pete Halat, who found the Sherry's, says the front door was unlocked when he got there, but he didn't see any sign of an intruder. We're thinking this person came in for the sole purpose of killing these two people. It's not every day in Mississippi, at least, and I don't think anywhere in the country that a state circuit court judge and his city council woman wife or murdered execution style in what's obviously a contract murder. It was kind of an, uh, an unusual thing to see because it was an area that was mainly populated by very well-to-do people and crime of any sort, much less violent crime, was pretty rare. The murders of the Sherry's had a tremendous effect uh, on the citizens in Biloxi and along the coast. Everyone was very concerned. They were fearful that someone else might be killed. Before Hurricane Katrina laid waste to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, they called this area the playground of the South. But when it came to the Sherry's, someone was playing dirty. Judge Sherry was obviously a sitting state circuit court judge. He might have developed enemies that decided to kill not only him, but his wife in retribution, perhaps for a sentencing. And Margaret Sherry's ambitions may have provided a motive as well. She was a hard driver as a city councilwoman and demanded a lot. Another honest person wanted to have honesty in, in city government and she was going to run, uh, eventually run for mayor and uh, was going to make a lot of changes in the city. 
After losing the race for mayor in 1985, Margaret was gearing up for a second campaign to take City Hall. For businesses on the seedier side of town, her election would have meant trouble. She had been very politically active, had come out very strongly against the existence of a certain strip clubs operated near the beach in Biloxi. And numerous rumors were circulating that perhaps local politicians were involved or prominent businessmen. The police quickly realized they may be in over their heads. The brass, the higher-ups, wanted the case solved as quickly as possible. They did have outside departments coming in to help them, because I'm not sure how many professional hits Alexi police had worked. When two people that well-known can be, you know, slaughtered like that inside their house, you know, behind their closed door of their home, it's a story that everybody wants to see come to some conclusion. Biloxi, where antebellum mansions and southern charm clash with casinos, strip clubs, and corruption. To solve this case, investigators were going to have to wade deep in Mississippi mud. From first appearances, this will be a very difficult crime to solve. Investigators say these are all just long shots, and they are just beginning to put together the pieces. The governor said he was saddened by their deaths. He said they were close personal friends and served with distinction. In, both in the days following the gangland-style killings of Vincent and Margaret Sherry, reporters from all over the South descend on Biloxi. It was probably the biggest news here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Covered everything else. That was morning, afternoon. Many believe the murders were motivated by the Sherry's political careers. As a judge, um, any time you decide a case, you, you uh, somebody becomes upset. At least 50% of the people become upset. There were stories about a death threat that Vincent had referred to. It was a transcript of a proceeding in his courtroom in which he told a woman that he had recently had a death threat. I don't think most people thought of either of the Sherry's as folks with, with enemies that would want to kill them. Unfortunately, violence and politics have a long history in this country. To get to the bottom of who shot the Sherry's, investigators started at square one. Vincent Sherry and Margaret Smith met as college students in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and married during their senior year. Vince joined the Air Force, eventually becoming a JAG officer. His growing family followed him from base to base. Biloxi had been Margaret's favorite place to live along the way. So after Vince retired from the military in 1970, the family laid down roots there. They settled in an upscale neighborhood nestled between a luxurious country club and an idyllic shoreline. Well, where they lived in a place called Ancient Oaks, and uh, more of an affluent community, north side of the bay. It's more of a wealthy area, and high-end homes. But Vince Sherry was fascinated by Biloxi's grittier side and embarked on a second career as a criminal defense attorney. He soon partnered with a young hotshot named Pete Halat. Halat was of Yugoslavian descent. He was very active in, in some of the community organizations there, and he was generally, I think, seen as, uh, you know, a true child of Biloxi. He attended college and law school up in Jackson, Mississippi, and eventually became one of the youngest county court judges in the state of Mississippi back in the 70s. Together, the two men made a powerful and profitable team. They were one of the best-known law firms in Biloxi, a successful law firm, especially with regard to uh, criminal defense work. Meantime, Mrs. Sherry had found her own calling, winning a seat on the city council. She may have been short in stature, but she was a giant in feistiness. She was very outspoken, very frank, spoke her mind, and when things didn't go in that council meeting as she thought they should have been going, she let her feelings be known. No one walked over Margaret Sherry. She vowed to clean up Biloxi's seamy side, even if it meant going head-to-head -head with her husband's clients. Margaret used to call him the vice attorney, 
She was out there trying to knock out the, the vice in Biloxi. He, on the other end, was representing the strip joint. In the mid-80s, the couple was well-established among Biloxi's elite. Vincent was appointed circuit court judge, and Margaret was considering her second run for mayor. They were seen at different uh, charitable events, civic events. They were seen a, a lot around town. They were involved in their community. From small-time crooks to wealthy politicians, everyone in town knew the Sherrys. After their shocking murders, hundreds of people turned out to remember them. From the sidelines, investigators are watching. They had to wonder if the reason they were murdered had to do with uh, their public lives somehow. Either the, the people that did it or certainly the reasons it would happen were still right there. Though he wasn't slated to speak at the funeral, Pete Halat steps up to deliver a powerful speech. The eulogy really was obviously the most dramatic part of the funeral uh, because here was Vincent Sherry's great friend and partner in the law practice talking about what Margaret Sherry's legacy should be and the idea of accountability uh, in government. But the longer Halat wears on, the less it seems he's memorializing his friends and the more it seems he's running for office. Now that's got to be the ultimate in tacky behavior, using a funeral to launch your political career. Halat even had copies of his eulogy distributed to the press. As the Sherrys are laid to rest, investigators get their first lead in the case from one of the couple's neighbors. A young man had been standing out in the driveway of his own residence and had observed a yellow Ford Fairmont. It did not belong in the neighborhood. He did not recognize it as one of his neighbors. But when the driver saw this young man and his friends, then it pulled away. But the young man and his friends got a very good look at the driver. A composite sketch of the suspicious visitor is released to the media. Then, another break. One week after the murders had occurred, the Yellow Ford Fairmont was recovered at an apartment complex about one mile away from the Sherry residence. Investigators learned the car was stolen from a nearby dealership just days before the murders. On the car at the time it was recovered was a switched license plate. And when we ran the plate number, it actually came back to an Oldsmobile, which had been abandoned three years earlier at an apartment complex in the city of Biloxi. We knew if we could identify how that tag made it from the abandoned vehicle and was held for three years and placed on this vehicle driven by the hitman, that it could be very beneficial to us. Investigators tracked down the car's original owner, who tells him that he let a man named Lenny Sweatman have the car for parts. Police are familiar with the name. Sweatman's an ex-con with a lot of friends in low places. We knew from uh, our knowledge uh, base on criminal criminals and the criminal element on the coast that if Lenny Sweatman was involved in something like this, then Mike Gillich would have been either leading the way or equally involved. Mike Gillich is the owner of several Biloxi strip clubs, including the popular Golden Nugget. He's also a high roller in what cops know as the Dixie Mafia. The Dixie Mafia supposedly was this kind of loose aggregate of criminals throughout the Southeast. Sometimes they'd band together to do a drug deal. Sometimes it would be to do some sort of bank ripoff or some sort of fraud. They had guys that laundered money. They had different people that played different roles. And when they had the need for a particular job, they'd call those people together and commit these criminal acts. Some people referred to the Dixie Mafia as the cornbread Cosa Nostra, but indeed, they were a force to be reckoned with. So what did they have to do with the judge and his wife? No one would believe the answer.
A week after Vince and Margaret Sherry were gunned down in an apparent contract hit, investigators start looking for any connection between the victims and an organized crime outfit known as the Dixie Mafia. Investigating Vince Sherry's old law firm, detectives turn up a lead. Pete Halat, Sherry's former partner, is actively representing a notorious Dixie Mafia kingpin named Kirksey McCord Nix. He was a power player, but he had spent more time in jail than out. Phone records show Nix had an unusual amount of contact with his attorney's office, especially for a guy with no chance at parole. They determined that there had been literally hundreds of telephone calls between the Halat Law Office and the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, Louisiana. Investigators start connecting the dots. We knew that Gillich was also tight with Angola inmate Kirksey McCord Nix. And of course, we had already known that Nix was in constant telephonic contact with Pete Hallett's law office in Biloxi. So all of a sudden, you had a little circle developing here. And we went from Swetman to Gillich to Nix to Hallett. And the investigation expanded out from there. When your friend gets whacked and you're up to your elbows in rotten clients, you better believe cops are going to ask questions. Most people would have run for cover. Pete Halat ran for mayor. I run not against any particular person or party, but against the style of government which pads the public payroll with consultants and cronies while our police and firefighters risk their lives for less than a living wage. A style of government which announces grand plans and ends up with grand juries. A lot wins handily. Once he became mayor, of course, he started placing individuals that uh, were friends and allies in key positions in the city, which, of course, affected the leadership at the Biloxi Police Department. With Halat at the helm, the unsolved Sherry murders are no longer a top priority, and the case grinds to a halt. And we've gone about as far as we can go. We're finally running this out. There's all the leads just about been run down by that time. There's no smoking guns, and we haven't gotten anywhere as far as making arrests on people. The murder happened in 87, and then here comes 88 and then 89, and the years continued to go by, and they just weren't getting a break. And of course, they started working on other cases, and, and it seemed like the Sherry case was just going to sit in the cold case file. After about two years, and actually very little progress had been made in coming up with a final resolution of the murders, the oldest daughter of Vince and Margaret Sherry hired a private investigator. Following up on the Dixie Mafia connection, the private eye uncovers an invaluable informant at Angola State Prison, Bobby Joe Fabian. Mr. Fabian, who had been a longtime friend of Kirksey McCord Nix, said that Judge Sherry had been killed because of missing money from an elaborate scam being run out of the penitentiary. Fabian tells the P.I that Nix masterminded the scam in which Angola inmates placed hundreds of personal ads targeting homosexual men. The writer claimed to be a young male looking for a little love. Hi, my name is Bobby. I'm, uh, you know, I'm 21 years old. I'm 5'11", weigh 155 pounds, have blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm just looking for some loving. You know, I'm looking for a companion, somebody who, who can... You know, you know, please contact me right to this address. Then it would start, you know, well, I need $500 to pay my lawyer, or I need $1,000 and I can get out of jail for this reason or that reason. And they would establish pen pal sort of relationships with people, and then they'd begin taking all this money. literally hundreds of scam victims around the country. 
We are very confident that there were hundreds of thousands of dollars illegally collected from the scam and perhaps into the millions of dollars. But more important to the investigators is where that money landed and who was protecting the purse. It would be picked up by friends and associates and relatives of the Angola inmates, collected, and much of it was delivered to Pete Halas Law Office in Biloxi. It's a stunning allegation against Biloxi's mayor. But before investigators have a chance to follow up, Fabian decides to go public. Peter Lett was holding a large amount of money for four of us. You see, me, Curtsy, and uh, someone else, you know. And um, when his money was demanded, uh, he said uh, Sherry swung with it. Sherry was holding it. When you say swung, uh, you mean what? He uh, ripped us off. Peter Lett knew, and uh, they didn't want to give us our money, that somebody was going to die in better Sherry than him. Sherry was killed because a hit was put on them by Peter Lett and Curtsy Nix. From there, the case just exploded. I mean, Fabian named names and said, here is what happened. You have this sitting mayor who's now being accused of being part of this plot to murder his law partner and his law partner's wife. I mean, it was just wild. After two years without any new leads in the case, the stalled out investigation gets a major jump start. When the rumors and whatnot last week that we were backing off the case, I'm telling you we're not backing off the case. We're going to pursue the case until somebody is indicted for capital murder for the death of the sheriffs. Bobby Joe Fabian literally handed us this case on a silver platter. That information from Mr. Fabian is what enabled us actually to open a federal investigation on the Sherry murders. But Halat fights back. Continuing rumors based upon allegations by convicted murderers and even idle speculation by well-meaning people have become the basis for opportunism. These reports, suggestions, and other innuendos are untrue and totally unfounded. Instead of cutting ribbons and kissing babies, this mayor was now a suspect in one of the biggest scandals to hit the South. Whether he could slither his way out of this mess remained to be seen. With Bobby Joe Fabian's tip, investigators are one step closer to connecting the Dixie Mafia to the murders of Vincent and Margaret Sherry. Zeroing in on the Halat Sherry Law Office, they uncover a new player in the scheme. Sherry uh, LaRae Sharp was the longtime girlfriend of Kirksey McCord Nix. Mr. Nix arranged for Ms. Sharp to work directly in Pete Halas Law Office in Biloxi. The 36-year-old blonde was apparently employed as a paralegal, but there was more. We obtained subpoenas and did locate where Pete Halat and LaRae Sharp had jointly rented a safe deposit box at a local Biloxi bank. How in the world did Sherry LaRae Sharp end up with paralegal credentials? Unless they were teaching Law 101 at the Arkansas Bordello where she grew up. Something very fishy had to be going on. Investigators soon pieced together what may have happened. Some of that money went missing. Kirksey Nix found out about it, said that I'm going to whack whoever stole my money. Pete Halat, one way or another, communicated either through commission or omission that Vincent Sherry may well have taken the money. To the Dixie Mafia, this would have been a crime punishable by death. Somebody needed a hit done or whatever. They put the word out. Gillich was considered the central sort of figure. He could get done pretty much whatever you needed done. 
Meanwhile, Fabian's TV interview generates a tip that links known Dixie Mafia hitman, John Ransom, to the case. We eventually learn that Mr. Ransom traveled to Biloxi on two occasions in early 1987 and met with an individual, a white male named Pete, to discuss the Sherry murders. In May of 1991, a grand jury hands investigators some good news. Four people were indicted, which included Mr. Gillich, the nightclub owner in Biloxi, Mr. Nix, the Angola inmate, Mr. Ransom, the Dixie Mafia hitman, and LaRae Sharp, uh, Nix's girlfriend, who was coordinating the scam from Halad's office. What eventually was alleged in the indictment is that the, the Lonely Heart scam was the center of the criminal conspiracy, and that the Sherry murders were, you know, kind of like the spokes of, the, of a wheel. But everyone wonders, where is the mayor? Peter Lett was not named in the first indictment. And of course, that was really the, you know, the most sensational part of the original allegations from Bobby Joe Fabian. He had ties to all these people, Mike Gillich, Kirksey McCord Nix, Kirksey's girlfriend, Lorraine Sharp. So yeah, he knew all of these folks, had ties, had business dealings with them. Halat claims he's been vindicated. What I am here to tell you today is that the indictment issued in the grand jury investigating this case for the past two years did not name me because I was not in any way involved in any prison scam or the plot to murder my friends, Vince and Margaret Sherry. That is what I told you the day that you came to me with the insulting suggestion that I was somehow involved. You'd think people would see through this guy's act, but apparently he'd won over most of Biloxi with his perfect hair, designer suits, and saccharine smile. Still, he wasn't off the hook. The Sherry murders were at the forefront with all of us. That's what the whole case was about. It had to do with the fraud, the scam, the interstate travel. It had to do with the conspiracy theory around the murder itself. The trial for a while clearly did not focus on the four people who were sitting on the defense table. It clearly focused on Pete Led and yet he was not on trial. He's not sitting there, he's not named. The one thing that was sort of hanging over really all of the first trial was uh, really the question about uh, whether or not Pete Lett would ever be charged. But the government's first task is to prosecute the prison scam. We even had scam victims from as far away as California come in and testify how they had been scammed, how they had read an ad in a newspaper, had responded and been scammed for 50000 or 100000 A litany of sketchy witnesses take the stand. The prosecution's case inherently relied on testimony from a fairly unsavory and colorful, you know, cast of characters. We had to use witnesses that were not prime candidates for Best Person of the Year award, and the jury just had to decide for themselves whether or not these witnesses were telling the truth. The prosecutor's stellar lineup included a counterfeiter, a hitman, a bank robber, drug dealers, and prostitutes. When the jury finally left to deliberate, no one was sure how this bizarre story would end. After a few days of deliberation, the jury finds Kirksey Nix, Lorray Sharp, Mike Gillich and John Ransom, guilty of conspiracy and wire fraud. But the prosecution is just getting started. The best way to make a case is to have somebody talking to you from the inside of the case. Only a few key criminal insiders knew the whole story of how the murders went down, who actually pulled the trigger on the Sherry's, and why, for that matter. Investigators place their bets on Mike Gillich. For his role in the scams, he gets the max sentence, 15 years in prison. 
Gillich, even at the time, was not a young man. At some point, I think he just got the idea that if I don't make this deal, I might very well spend every single one of my, my final days in a federal prison. When you slam that jailhouse door on somebody, I don't care how mean and tough and big and bad they are, that sound sometimes changes a fellow's mind. Two years in the joint is no lap dance, and the Dixie Don finally folds. We were advised by Mr. Gillich's attorney that Mr. Gillich had had enough, and he was ready to sit down and talk to the FBI about what actually happened in the Sherry case. The first thing investigators want to know is the trigger man's identity. He told us the hit man was a man named Thomas Holcomb. Holcomb, an ex-con and part-time carnival worker from Texas, was the only person they could find who was dumb enough to take the job. I said, but yes, what can we corroborate regarding him? And he said, I recall on the night of the Sherry murders, he decided he wanted to test fire the 22 caliber pistol. Gillich directs them to a run-down Biloxi home. I recall getting a flashlight and crawling up under that house. What Mr. Gillich had told me appeared to be correct. There were bullet holes in the floor, and it had been there six years. Feds now have the shooter in their sights, but they're still angling for their big fish. As the case developed, of course, we were continuing to our attempts to come up with proof and additional information that Pete Halat was involved not only in the scams, but in the murders of the Sherry's. Gillich tells them Nix summoned Halat to Angola some months before the murders. Imagine walking into a prison cell and having to answer to a mobbed-up killer like Kirksey Nix. Someone had to pay for the missing money, and it wasn't going to be Halat. Kirksey McCord and Nix didn't just decide one day that Vince Sherry took his money, because there was no way he could have known that. Shortly after delivering this false story implicating Judge Sherry and taking the money, Mr. Halat returned to Biloxi and went to the bank where he had his safe deposit box, closed that original safe deposit box, opened a new safe deposit box with a very similar number assigned to it, and added Vince Sherry's name onto that box. He was trying to show that Mr. Sherry had access to a safe deposit box that had the scam money in it. On October 23rd, 1996, almost a decade after the Sherry murders, Pete Halat is indicted. Oh, the community was in an uproar because now it named Pete Halat as a defendant. He's there in black and white with those other defendants. Halat is charged with conspiracy to commit murder, along with Kirksey McCord Nix, Thomas Holcomb, and Larray Sharp. We had all types of indiv individuals charged here we, and involved uh, in these criminal activities, everybody from murderers to mayors. Halat rails against his accusers. To suggest that my representation of an inmate in Angola would connect me to, to, the, to a case involving my best and dearest friend is just preposterous. Just preposterous. Those people who would know Pete and his mama and his daddy and his grandmother, there was no way Pete Halat was going to be convicted in those people's minds. No way. Other people have been convinced all along that if he wasn't involved, he knew what was going down, and he didn't do anything to stop it. In June of 1997, a decade after the Sherry murders, trial opens and the media is ready and waiting. It resulted in the deaths of two fine people and in cheating people all over the country in a sordid scheme which Mr. Halat's law office uh, was the clearinghouse and the centerpiece.
The government's case is similar to the first trial. Only this time, Pete Halat is front and center. Prosecutors tell jurors the defendant had to know about the scam. We developed several sources who admitted delivering money to the Halat law firm. It was often turned over to Lorraine Sharp. It's my recollection that on at least one or two occasions, money was actually handed to Pete Halat. But records reveal Halat played more than just banker. When he certified Lorraine Sharp as a paralegal, he gave her carte blanche at Angola. It allowed her to use the legal mail to send scam letters in and out. It allowed legal telephone calls that were not monitored by prison authorities. So it gave her a lot of leeway. The room falls silent when Mike Gillich takes the stand and tells the jury that Halat had a big time role in both the scam and the murders. The guy who had been kind of at the center of you know, of most of the city's criminal enterprise for a good stretch, was now turning tail and essentially working for the cops, and that the bad guy in this case was the guy who had been mayor. It was just a very interesting reversal there. Just was pulsating to hear him turn on his friend, to admit that basically Pete Hallett had this role, and I'll tell you exactly how he had the role, and I'll tell you exactly where the guns were fired as, we, as they planned this thing out. But the government is quick to remind the jury that their case is more than just a he said, he said. It's letting Leroy Sharp operate out of his office. It's the hundreds and hundreds of phone calls into and out of his office having to do with this. It's the keeping the bad guy's money. I hate to say the proof's in the pudding, but Vince Sherry was dead. Margaret Sherry was dead. All this conversation back and forth, all these relationships went to show that when the finger was pointed, I didn't do it. He did it. The defense tells jurors that the Dixie Mafia witnesses are not to be trusted, that they do anything to save their own skins. I found holes in every person who testified if they were in jail. I mean, these were people who were saying whatever they needed to say to help their case and to help them move forward with their lives and get out of prison. I certainly remember, in particular, Halad's attorneys just going after Gillich and his credibility like rabid dogs because they knew that that was what they had to do. But there's one witness the defense will have a harder time discrediting. In 1987, Charles Legere was a young attorney at Halat and Sherry's law office. Mr. Alat told him that he wanted to go out and check on Judge Sherry, but he didn't want to go alone. He wanted Mr. Legere to go with him. When they got to the residence, Mr. Halat briefly entered the front door and immediately observed the body of Judge Sherry on the floor in the den. According to Mr. Legere, Mr. Halat immediately exited the residence and made the statement something to the effect, Vince and Margaret are dead. The prosecution thinks they've caught Halat in a lie. Margaret's body had been nowhere near Vince Sherry's body. In fact, her body was found more or less behind a bed in the very back of the house, back bedroom. So Mr. Legere reported that there was no way Pete Halat could have known Margaret Sherry was dead without prior knowledge of the event. When it was the defense's turn, Halat's lawyers realized they had little to work with. They only called two witnesses. Their whole case took less time than the lunch recess. The courtroom gallery was divided, the city was split, but what the jury thought was anyone's guess. One week after closing arguments in the Sherry murder trial, the jury reaches a verdict. From what I remember, the courtroom was crowded. Here's Pete Hallett sitting at the same table as with Thomas Holcomb and Larry Sharp and Kirksey Nix. You just knew in his mind he knew he didn't belong here. And he wondered, how in the world did I put myself in this position? But the jury sends Halat a reality check. 
They find him guilty on charges that he lied and concealed records of the scam. A day later, they deliver another blow. All defendants, including Halat, are found guilty of conspiracy. Most of the courtroom was shocked when all of them were found guilty. Pete Hallett's face just drained. At the moment where I had to go on the air and tell the people of Biloxi what had happened, I found myself almost shocked that I was saying Pete Hallett, the former mayor of the city of Biloxi, is guilty. Words like that aren't supposed to come out of your mouth. It's nice that after all this time, they've proven not only who was in the house, but who was involved. It's a great relief to the family. You, know, you don't celebrate at guilty verdicts, but you can't help but be glad when you get a guilty verdict after putting so much into a case, you know. Months later, the Motley crew is sentenced. Life for Nix and Holcomb. Five years for Larray Sharp and 18 years for Pete Halat. Many people in Biloxi wonder if justice was served. The government didn't prove, never set out to prove, that Halat had any direct knowledge of or involvement with the murders. All they had to do was prove that he was involved in a large-scale criminal conspiracy, one element of which was the killing of the Sherrys. We simply could not prosecute a murder charge because we did not have a statute at the time. But that's what the case was all about. It all had to do with bringing the people to justice who committed the Sherry murders and all. All this stuff, all these facts and all these peripheral charges, that's what we had to work with. So that's what we did. Some people still don't believe Peter Lett's guilty to this day. They think now what they thought then. That, you know, what did the government prove? But most of Biloxi now remembers Halat as the mayor who thought he could get away with murder. Even though he thought he was untouchable, he was not in his powerful position and his privileged status meant nothing. Pete Halat appealed his case all the way up to the Supreme Court, but they rejected his petition for a new trial. Seems the political charm had finally worn off. He won't be getting out of prison until 2013. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.